Well, what's up guys? I'm back and it's Friday, so you know it's what the fitness time. What the f And this week we have a return guest to our show, Dr. James D. Nicolantonio. Dr. James D. Nicolantonio. D. Nicolantonio. Anyone? I'd like to buy a Val. Anyone? Please help. Send help. This guy loves to get on Twitter and talk nonsense. This particular post would be like two truths and a lie. <laughs> he says some stuff in here that's not completely terrible, but also some stuff that's completely misleading. So the tweet goes, things that seem obvious to most people who know, but are not to most. Oh, so like you woke, bruh. They woke. So if you know these things, you woke and they're obvious. All right, let's see how obvious they are. Number one, salt is not your enemy, it's sugar. <laughs> we have to make the comparison valid. So we need to look at the condition that we're talking about what they're the enemy for. Like we can't just say health because that's such a nebulous term. So let's go with cardiovascular disease and hypertension since in particular sodium or salt is typically vilified for its effects on hypertension. I actually tend to think that salt intake isn't as big of a deal as it's been made out to be with the caveat that it depends very much on if you are considered salt sensitive. So amongst people who are hypertensive, 51% are salt sensitive, over half. Amongst normotensive people, meaning they don't have hypertension, about 26% are salt sensitive. Now, what do I mean when I say salt sensitive? Salt sensitive means that if you have a higher intake of sodium, your body doesn't eliminate it effectively either through the skin and your sweat or through your kidneys and your urine. Typically when the kidneys and skin and these elimination systems are working well, if you increase your sodium intake, you just excrete more in the days following. I mean, I've worked with people who were completely normotensive and I had one gal in particular, she was consuming like 15,000 milligrams of sodium a day, which is like seven times what's recommended. But she had no problems. She was no more tensive, no apparent morbidities. It's more about, are you salt sensitive? And if you're salt sensitive, based on some meta-analyses and Mendelian randomization trials, it's pretty clear that there's a causal effect. So when I talk about Mendelian randomization, what we're talking about is studies that look at genetic polymorphisms and stratify people into those who are better at eliminating salt, meaning if they have higher sodium intakes, it doesn't really affect them that much because their bodies are very good at getting rid of it. And they stratify those against those who do not eliminate sodium well. So when they look at that and the effects on hypertension and cardiovascular disease risk, there's a pretty linear association. So if you aren't salt sensitive, probably not a big deal. If you are salt sensitive, then it might be a very big deal. Now, how would you know if you're salt sensitive? Well, probably one of the best ways that I can think about doing it is simply increase your sodium intake for a week, you know, consume double to what you had been consuming and have your blood pressure checked before you started and then after you started and check it at the same time every single day. Then cut your sodium way down and see if there's changes in blood pressure. If you get big changes in blood pressure, then you're probably relatively salt sensitive and should probably try to limit it to under 2000 milligrams a day. Now, is sugar truly your enemy? When well, we're comparing these things straight up and their effects on cardiovascular disease. If we look at addition and subtraction studies that don't control for calories, we do see a very tight association between sugar intake and cardiovascular disease risk. And when I say cardiovascular disease risk, I mean blood lipids that are predictors of cardiovascular disease. In replacement studies where we look at either increasing or decreasing sugar and replacing it with other dietary carbohydrate, there is no effect on cardiovascular disease risk and no effect on blood lipids associated with cardiovascular disease. So this idea that salt isn't your enemy, it's sugar, uh, it's kind of a bait and switch. Should you be mindful of your sugar intake? Of course, because if you're popping a few Cokes throughout the day, it's not like you're gonna say, well, that was 75 grams of carbohydrate in those Cokes, so I'm going to decrease that out of the rest of my dietary intake. No, they're usually added on top of what you're already consuming and it's not very satiating and you eat more calories. So you need to be careful about it from that perspective. But 
Do you need to worry about the sugar in fruit or having a sugary treat every once in a while if you are accounting for it in your caloric budget? No, you do not. Whereas if you are salt sensitive, you need to be careful about salt intake regardless. Number two, this is my favorite. Fat is only harmful in the presence of refined carbohydrates. Possibly true, possibly true. It's very difficult to overeat on a low carb, high fat diet. But I can make the exact opposite argument for carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are only fattening in the presence of dietary fat. Let me explain. So you can check out a study that was done back in the 70s where the average participant lost 140 pounds and the diets were primarily made up of white rice, fruit, juice, and sugar. That's it. But they didn't really eat much dietary fat at all. So again, you can make the exact opposite argument. Further, they've shown that when you overfeed either dietary fat or dietary carbohydrate, both are equally fattening. And furthermore, if we look at hunter-gatherer tribes like the Hadza, they eat a very high carbohydrate, very low fat diet. They do not develop obesity, they do not develop insulin resistance, they do not develop heart disease. And if we look at the Kuna from Panama, they're basically a hunter-gatherer tribe, but they have access to white sugar and their dietary carbohydrate intake is 65% of their daily calories, 17% of which is likely from sugar. Shout out to Stefan Guillenet for doing those calculations. Guess what? They don't become obese. They don't develop heart disease. They don't develop type two diabetes. Why? Because they eat a very low fat diet. So yes, Dr. Nico, Fat is likely only harmful in the presence of refined carbohydrates. Refined carbohydrates are likely only harmful in the presence of dietary fat. See how fun that is when I flip your own logic or lack thereof on you? Science, bitch. Vegetable oil is not heart healthy. Well, it depends on the context, Jimmy. If we're talking about slathering vegetable oil, all over a diet that you're already eating, yeah, it's probably not heart healthy because it's adding quite a bit of calories. But if we look at replacement studies where saturated fat is exchanged for polyunsaturated fats, which some of which are vegetable oils, we see reductions in LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, meh, but we see pretty big changes in LDL cholesterol. In one study where they exchanged palm oil for sunflower oil, I believe, they actually saw like changes in lean body mass too, which was really strange. I'm not quite sure how to explain that. That's more heart healthy than saturated fat and butter. Now there's gonna be LDL cholesterol deniers who I know will come into these comments and leave their wretched, stupid remarks. I will quite simply say this. Once again, if we look at Mendelian randomization studies, which are the best for looking at this sort of thing, because you're looking at the effects of lifetime exposure of low LDL secretors versus high LDL secretors, there is a linear effect of increasing LDL blood concentrations on the incidence of heart disease. I will say it again, a linear effect. And people go, well, LDL doesn't matter. It's actually HDL. Well, no, actually it's fucking not. Because in these Mendelian randomization trials, they show that increasing HDL doesn't actually reduce the incidence of heart disease. HDL is more of a passive indicator of overall metabolic health. So yes, if you have higher HDL, you're more metabolically healthy, you probably have a lower overall risk, but it's not causal. And in fact, drugs that increase HDL do not decrease cardiovascular disease risk, whereas drugs that decrease LDL do decrease cardiovascular disease risk. Now, once again, people get this all fucked up because they'll say, well, my LDL is high and I'm 80 years old, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, I also know somebody who smoked every day of their adult life and lived to be 90 as well. I, I don't think that makes smoking every day a good piece of advice. If you have high HDL and high LDL, are you lower risk than someone who has low HDL and high LDL? Yes, you're lower risk. But are you as low risk as somebody who has high HDL, low LDL? No, you are not. And they have done these stratifications in various studies. Same thing with inflammation. Yes, if you have low inflammation, high HDL and high LDL, you are lower risk than somebody who has high LDL, but also high inflammation and low HDL. But you are not as low risk as you could be if your LDL was lower. And that's what's known as an independent fucking risk factor, Jimmy.
So once again, if you can lower saturated fat intake, you can lower LDL. And again, studies that substitute saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats show a reduction in LDL cholesterol and disease risk. Number four, junk food increases hunger. I'm going to be a little bit pedantic here. It depends on the comparator. If you eat 500 calories of junk food, are you hungrier than before you ate it? The evidence actually says no. But if you take somebody and you take them from an unprocessed food diet to a ultra processed food diet, what happens? They increase their calorie intake because it is definitely not as satiating as an unprocessed or minimally processed diet. Again, more caloric density, less satiation. So he's technically not right, but I understand where he's going with it. And I would say practically he's not wrong. He's just too stupid to understand the difference and why that actually still isn't accurate. But anyways, number five, my favorite weight loss has nothing to do with counting calories. It also has nothing to do with counting fucking carbohydrates, Jimmy. Andy, it's just a tool. Calorie counting is just a tool. That's it. It's just a tool. Just like, I don't know, a budget. You could say, well, a budget has nothing to do with saving money. You're right. If you want to save money, you have to earn more money than you spend. It still doesn't change the fact that a budget is a useful tool for many people who are trying to save money, just like counting calories can be a useful tool for people who want to lose weight. Is it for everybody? No. Some people don't find it helpful, but millions of people have. Why do you fucking care? I don't quite understand why these people are so against calorie count. Actually, I do understand why they're against calorie counting because of the implication that is inherent in counting calories and energy balance, personal responsibility. Because even though it's still personal responsibility, it's easier for these charlatans to fleece you when they talk about low carb. Well, no, no, it's not your fault that you're overweight. It's actually the evil food industry making processed carbohydrates. But how is it six of one has dozen the other? You're still eating too many carbohydrates by their logic. So how is that not personal responsibility? But people don't like the implication of energy balance. You're eating too much. When we say you're eating too much, we're just talking about for your given level of energy expenditure. I'm not saying that you're a sloth. I'm not saying you're lazy. I'm not saying you're a glutton. Many people feel rather restricted even though they're eating a relatively higher calorie amount. Feelings are not facts as much as we would like them to be. I know this is kind of a long what the fitness, but there was a lot of bullshit in there. Shout out to Jimmy for always providing quality content for what the fitness. All right, low carb crazies, make sure you get in those comments and leave an angry message and make sure you buy some of my shit because I hate it when you do that. I'll catch you guys next week.